The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the second half of the fourth movement of Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra. Yesterday's lecture left me really energized, and I'm ready to roll through the second half, which is actually not that long. It's just three screens, and most of it is fairly easy to talk about, but I strongly recommend having watched the first lecture as a prelude to this, so you can get some of the context of what I'm talking about. We are back to part A, according to some analyses of this particular movement, and we start off with that leap of a minor ninth, which is a little bit obscured because of these other instruments sort of finishing up their particular lines. It isn't a case like we saw before, where, say, brass would come in and the other idea would sort of tail off smoothly into it. This is more a question of the brass continuing on and being fairly loud and kind of getting in the way, and it really requiring all of the strings to push into this leap of a minor ninth just to really compete with what's going on everywhere else. But it is a really great unison. If you notice that tenor clef, that's a G, below middle C, alto clef, G below middle C, and of course treble clef, those are all G's below middle C. So this is a massive unison of the entire string section except for the double bass. And that continues on for all of the instruments, just going all the way up to this high G. Really powerful effect there. And then everything tails off for the violins, but the lower strings continue on really pushing into it, and then finally finishing off here. Now, while that is happening, the horns arpeggiate up, a4, to this forte pianissimo chorale, which is the same as in section A. You might recall the English horn coming in and helping out a little bit with the harmony and some other more complex structural elements. But Schoenberg wants to avoid that because he wants you to focus on the return of this particular section. So instead, he adds other voices, namely bassoons playing these C-thirds. Do you remember the little C-thirds that were underpinning the harmony previously when this section first introduced itself? And F-sharps being played in octaves this time divided between the contrabassoon and bass clarinet. But that doesn't last for too long. As soon as there is motion in the chorale, these elements back off. There's a middle harmonic voice supplied here by the first bassoon, which dovetails into the fourth horn right at this point. And then just a little bit of harmonies added, those C thirds once again, and a little pizzicato. Notice that Schoenberg marks distinct in the score. Right? He just wants that to stick out, but not be too loud. Now, we see this same harmonic motion come back, right? Not helped out the second time by a concert middle C, as we saw here in the bassoon. But leading to this beautifully stretched out chord. I just want to point out here that what Schoenberg is suggesting for the first hornist is really difficult. And you will hear some first-class musicianship on the part of the first hornist in the recording that I'm about to play of this particular part. That player goes up to that high A and then a high B, which is just one pitch below high C, and they're able to control how loud they play there and really just keep it right at mezzo piano at the loudest, and that is really tough, playing extremely high notes with that much control. It can't have been easy for the player, and I really respect the effort that they're putting into it. 
And then, of course, here we see additional harmonic elements. This concert E flat being played by the English horn, and then low A flat below. Those are all adding to the four part harmony here. All right, that comes to an end right on the first beat of the next bar. And picking up right on the second beat, we have this striking inverted voicing of just a D flat major chord. If you look at all the elements, here's your D flat root written A flat for the fourth horn. And then the fifth is this A flat right here, which will sound a fifth higher. It's a little confusing to see all of these different transposed pitches that seem to be the same thing but aren't. So there's our D flat fifth, and then the median is this F written G, which is below them. So uh, very cool chord, but of course there isn't really a tonic reference to that because immediately, or almost immediately, this D gets thrown into the harmony, and that kind of throws off the whole idea of a nice safe resolution on D flat major, even though the F is reinforced by the first bassoon up here. But you won't really feel a sense of settling there. I really like the way that these little lines inject themselves. First we have the first bassoon, this time playing a leap downwards of a major seventh. And then right underneath this cello entrance, the tuba also jumps down, muted tuba right here. And as the cello plays this lovely tenor register line right in here, the second trumpet plays this kind of nattering, twittering little background line. It's a great way for elements to work against each other instead of with each other, if you see what I mean. Here we've got a nice cushiony background, more or less, and a beautiful cello solo over it. And in the background, somebody's going, yeah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Yeah, we've heard all this before. Don't bother me with that, kid. So that's kind of what this reminds me of. And our little section is finished by this rip upward of bassoon and bass clarinet doubling each other. Now you should start looking at doubling like this and just identifying it on your own. If you know that this is concert pitch, right, this D, and you know that bass clarinet transposes at a major ninth, you can see that these are the same pitches, right? E equals D an octave lower. That sounds like a physics equation. E equals D. So these are the same line, and as they rip upwards, you have these little clarinet thirds, and this little downward twitch by the first trumpet. And it ends with horn staccato accent, sforzando on the trumpet, and pizzicato in the strings. This is very similar to a couple of gestures that are not only near the beginning of the first movement, but also appear a little bit in the beginning of the A section. So it's like a little potpourri of different ideas that contrast each other once again. The idea of sudden change and very marked contrast between things, as opposed to smooth developments and lyrical trade-offs. So all of these particular ideas, the strings rising up, the horns taking over with their very moody chorale, the cello solo with the built-in heckler, and then just a little bit of punch right at the end. Those are all nicely contrasting elements, though notice that very few of them are all that loud, right? Even here, this is marked piano, and it's doubtful whether or not this would be much louder than, say, an orchestral mezzo forte, right? So adding all of the brightness and strength of the elements together, you'll get, you know, forte, mezzo forte, really not that huge of a forte unless the conductor really decides to punch it right here. But everything else is 
pretty controlled. Even this big reach right up here is not going to last for very long. And the crescendo right in here shouldn't be too big because that spoils what's going on in the horns. Not that that matters too much because the horns are going to project very beautifully no matter what's in front of them, unless it were, say, like the heavy brass blasting away or the strings going nuts over some choppy patterns. So have a listen to all of those elements. I think I described them plenty for you. Listen for the contrasts, listen for the support that you hear when, say, the horns are all playing together and other instruments come in to help out, or when the cello is playing its solo and there are these background harmony elements which are a little hard to hear. It's even hard to hear this little chattering in the background as well. But this stands out very, very obviously in total, except for maybe the clarinets, which are really a textural element that isn't that big, but you would hear it if it were taken away. Here we get to a page where you might recognize, maybe in retrospect, some of the same techniques that were used in places in Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And once again, the two pieces are not related to each other. However, I will say that this kind of scoring was undoubtedly familiar to Stravinsky after he scored the Rite of Spring. And it's very reminiscent to me of some of Stravinsky's works that he wrote, like the orchestrations of his three etudes, which were eventually turned into four etudes when he added his piece Madrid. Actually, the four etudes for orchestra is something that I would love to analyze for you guys someday because I feel it's some of Stravinsky's best scoring. But this same sort of seemingly random, but actually very carefully calculated and interrelated type of scoring is something that shows up in Stravinsky's works as well. I really love the way the oboe comes in here, obviously Hauptstimme, and immediately you hear the bass clarinet coming in as a contrapuntal support element, doing the little leap, and that transfers its way across the orchestra on nearly every beat following, which serves as an entrance of a sort to different instruments. So we see the English horn jump in here. First oboe is already engaged, but it picks up on that. Bassoon plays that leap as an entrance. And then the top solo cello comes in and plays it as well leaving the third horn to finish the passage. This is something I feel would be worth it to analyze harmonically from that particular standpoint. I feel that it's just texturally ingenious and very well balanced, especially the addition of the cellos, which are so easy to ignore, but which play a beautifully integral role in pulling the harmony together. Following that, it's really easy to ignore this first note or to hear it as if it were the beginning of this figure right here. <laughs> the, the ear can kind of confuse you and think it's ba 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 ba, but it really is its own thing playing on top there. And there's a tendency for the ear to get distracted by this rip upwards with all of the lower brass contributing. First and second trombone, third trombone and tuba all together. And then here, they're playing this harmonically, back to a unison harmonically, and ending with these high G flat thirds. Immediately decrescendo down to pianissimo. 
Okay, here we see some of those same elements that we had on the other page. The dropping thirds that were in the clarinet part return here. And then there is a big push right at the end with all of the horns. Notice here, A2, right? With first and second. And then actually playing all the way up to A natural. And this is an example of something that I pointed out in my tip about horn teamwork, is that sometimes first and second horn make a great team, and if you have some other sort of passage going on, and they play a couple of high notes, then that's all well and good. Generally speaking, though, if the passage were really very active and exposed, I would give this kind of line to the first and third. However, this makes for really good teamwork between the third and fourth players. So I'm not knocking that either. Of course, the real stars here in this particular section are the strings and winds. So here you've got a massive, I guess, A6, you could say, in, in the upper winds. Two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets. Very reminiscent of Holst scoring, isn't it? Especially unison with all the violins. And right here we've got this E flat in both cellos and violas. And this will have a very strained kind of frantic sound for that one pitch. It doesn't really need any support on it whatsoever. So adding all this together, yes, you'll hear very much the lower brass and it'll be hard to control that and to keep it from dominating everything. It'll be harder to actually hear this Hauptstimme line and the horns, or harder to balance for the conductor. But these triple F lines in the strings and winds are really going to dominate the most, I would say. Especially right here towards the end with the crescendo. But I really love this little tailing out here, this dive down of a seventh in the double basses, and rightly so marked as Hauptstimme. Of course, this could have had a little bit of support to be more penetrating, I feel. Like, me as an orchestrator, I might have doubled this with bassoons, like maybe even just one bassoon, to make sure that it was very clear against these really scorching G-flat thirds up here on these trombones, which is going to be extremely bright. But in the recording, you'll hear just how beautifully the trombonists bring this down to a pianissimo. It's spooky, just how well that they do that. And that just leaves the flute absent-mindedly playing this little line here. It's got a dive down of a ninth, and just seems very unconcerned with everybody's uptightness in previous bars. That's also something that I have noticed in later Stravinsky scoring that might have been influenced by this, is contrasts that can bring up maybe sort of absurd or nonchalant reactions to things in other parts. Once again, there are some great examples in the four etudes for orchestra. If that score becomes available, I would really love to do an analysis for everybody, including the masterpiece of the entire set, which is Madrid at the end, with the cascading sounds of different cantinas and music halls all crashing together in Stravinsky's ears as he walks down a boulevard. So right here at the end we have some very delicate harmony, this high G sharp in first bassoon. Right here we've got an E under that in first trombone, and this lovely little solo here on viola, which is going to be a little hard to hear if they're not playing out enough, but it's a nice echo right here in bass clarinet, right? So here we've got this little C sharp dive down to D, then up to F sharp, okay, followed by written C sharp down to written D, but that is actually sounding down a ninth, right? So that would actually be B down to C in the bass staff, and then ending out down here on a low G. 
And that sort of brings this particular section to a close. Once again, sort of short and I wouldn't say calmer because there's this big burst in the middle, but definitely having contrasts of calmness with some of the other activity that's going on in this particular section. So listen for all of those things, maybe a few too many to enumerate the way that these different voices enter and use this little hook here, which literally looks like a hook, to tie the music all together and help bring in some of the instruments, ending with this little third horn part right in here. Listen for the entrance of the a uh, two horns right here, which are not quite as loud as they could be compared to these rips that come in. And of course, just this big, massive line with all the upper strings and upper winds conspiring together, contrasted by a slightly, I don't know, inane, I said nonchalant earlier, kind of reaction by the flute, like, ah, oh, so what? You know, let those people freak out over there. I'm perfectly happy with my little ball and string toy here. And the way that everything comes to a close with this little downward hook by the viola and echo by the bass clarinet. This very last section is thought to be the A section returning at the end of the rondo. And there are some related harmonic and thematic gestures, with some riffs being very, very similar. But what I really feel is that this is more like a return of the C section myself, especially in that sense of accumulating different features in the music one of which is this stuttering rhythm, if you remember that. This time played in the trumpets pretty much exclusively. Then, of course, the way that these motives just stack on top of each other over and over again. And especially this huge stomping in the lower brass. That is right out of the C section. Some elements that are worth pointing out before we dig into this that I might miss if I don't remember to look at them right now. One of which is the tremolo with cello bow on the edge of the cymbal plate, right? And here is the notation for that crescendo. And then there's just a big push right here with the bow and it will have kind of a whoosh sound in the best of circumstances, along with a gong hit and a bass drum hit simultaneous. This could actually be played by one player, this gong and bass drum hit, if the instruments were set up correctly, but I would really want three percussionists at the very least for this entire set, even in the reduced orchestration. Okay, so those particular elements really worth pointing out. Also, these Sul Ponticello tremolo tenor register double basses. That is some cool stuff. So hopefully I will put all of that into context as we look through this. Let's break this down in terms of textural elements and building textures at first, and then we'll talk about the more thematic elements. Okay, so the first textural element that catches my eye as an orchestrator is this harmonic activity from the horns. And once again, marking of piano with fairly high notes, going all the way up here to A flat. I think an A flat accent in the best of circumstances, even with a P marking here, would be just about nearly mezzo forte and then this push into forte crescendo. By the time we got here, it might nearly be fortissimo or molto forte, right? And then really getting to this point right in here, it would really be committing and come out very strongly. And 
the problem with that is that everybody's going to try to match the first player, right? So that also builds in a trap if you write a very high note like this in a controlled dynamic. The other players are going to try to match the overall dynamic being led by the first player, and that puts a lot of pressure on them as well. So you really have to be careful about that kind of scoring. But I still find this lovely and intriguing, and it's one of those things that were I to be studying this for all of its different elements, harmonic and thematic and so on, that this is where I would just go and kind of play this out to myself or audiate it for myself, which I'm actually doing right now as I'm looking at this. Just really nicely done, despite that really high A flat on a P dynamic. I would say start there if you're going to take this apart. Just work out what's going on there. And it's just really a lovely part. Even if you were to play it, say, at reading this as concert pitch, it would still be interesting to do. But if you really want to be smart about it, play everything down a perfect fifth as a good challenge for your transposition. Okay, so that would be the first textural element that I would focus on. The second one would be these thirds right here, playing what is essentially an augmented chord sounding D flat augmented. And then just slowly working its way up, here we've got a written F augmented chord and then a written G augmented and so on. And that's all really, really fun. I really love the way that it just slowly kind of stutters and barks its way right into the consciousness of the listener, I would say. It's right here, probably like all the other elements coming around it would easily obscure it, but it does add a lot of subtle energy in the middle. And then under that, of course, the tremolo on the cymbal. And this isn't too far out. These kinds of ideas would have been floating around in the ether at the time that Schoenberg was scoring this. It wouldn't have been, say, something that he had thought up himself and everybody would have to go try it. People were trying all kinds of strange experiments like putting a cymbal on the head of a kettle drum and then hitting it and changing the tuning underneath it so that it would kind of make this weird, wavery sound. So all those kinds of tricks were known to percussionists and were kind of fun things to mess around with. So those techniques making their way into scores is not too surprising. So those are what I would think of as purely textural elements. Now, we have the sense of cumulative texture, which is played in different little groups of motives, starting right here with the second clarinet. Now notice the second clarinet starts off on the one and beat of a triplet from the beginning of the bar, and the second violin starts off on two and of a triplet. And essentially, these are the same exact pitches, right? So that they are just overlapping each other. Notice, though, that this is just really a smoothly articulated slur. And right here, we've got this very busy, kind of chattering 16th note measured tremolo in these triplets. Okay, so that is sort of counterpointing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth another textural element, if you will. Then, for the next bit of thematic texture, we go straight to this little line here in the violas, which is traded off, divisi, within the violas on different pitches, stepping over each other's lines, eventually jumping up to the first violins, once again on different pitches, and a little conversation arises here between these three different elements, right? Now notice that they are all sort of at a third away from each other, right? This starts on an E, this starts on a G, 
this starts on a D and this starts on an F, right? So there's a relationship of thirds there and a relationship of thirds there. And they just continue on together and they're not echoed or supported in any way by the winds. In fact, there is little to no doubling here. The instruments are basically just playing what they play. There's doubling right in here of the English horn and second oboe at first, but then basically it just turns into A2 and unison between all three players right in here. But other than little places like that, there is really just a sense of independence in each part. One thing that I find interesting in here is that the E flat clarinet at first doubles the A3 flutes and then plays an octave below them in its Shalomo register, basically supporting the octave doubling of the oboes, which is going to be a little tricky getting that B in this little rip to kind of come out without being too quacky. I mean, it's totally possible for a pro, but it's just still not the most comfortable of things. So probably helps to have the E flat clarinet helping out right in there. Okay. <laughs> and so as you can see, these elements just add together and build and build and build. I, I really love the way that this whole idea here that I was just talking about started over here in the first clarinet and then just continues on adding things and getting bigger and bigger. Towards the end, all these interlacing riffs sort of coalesce together. Not so much in the winds, but right here in the strings, they are reaching up to hit these high pitches here. The stuttering rhythms in the trumpets turn into this beautiful line that just soars all the way up there to high C. The harmonic cushion in the background just turns right into this lovely reach up here of the minor ninth, as we saw before. We're seeing that riff one last time with all four horns. The low winds just come out of nowhere with this great push downwards. And then, of course, all of our attention is really being taken up by this massive octave line in the lower brass that I mentioned before. So after it finishes that, there is this rip up at the end, very highly positioned for a lot of these instruments. Flutes ripping up to this high A flat, doubled by E flat clarinet as a written F natural, clarinets ripping up to their F, which will be sounding E flat, and then right in here we've got a little bit of ottava for the strings. And right after that, we have this little echo of motive in the clarinets. And this really reminds me of the way the bassoons had just a little bit more to say right at the end of the first movement. Nicely finished here by low bassoons and stopped horns as this tremolo keeps playing, which is actually fairly audible. You might think that these double basses are not going to be that easy to hear, but really, if the clarinetists can remember to play triple P, which they can beautifully in the Shalomo register, and this is really controlled right in here, these bassoons and stopped horns, and they're really playing sol ponticello down here on these basses, this should balance really nicely, and it does in the recording that we're just about to hear. So let's have a listen to all of those things now. Just really listen to how everything builds and it will happen very, very quickly. Poco a poco a cello rondo. This is over in just a few seconds. It goes by so quickly. So once again, you might want to listen to it several times along with the screen and really pick out those different elements. Just look at it and study it even before you let this video go on even more than I've explained it and then identify those elements as they go by in the score with the audio. And I will see you for the fifth and last trio of lectures on the last movement of this extraordinary suite for orchestra, probably in a few weeks. I'm a little unsure about how to manage the very last of these lectures kind of overlapping into a period where I want to make a lot of 
videos about tips in anticipation of the upcoming release of 100 more orchestration tips. But I will work that out and you'll know about that soon. So I hope you enjoyed this movement as much as I did. I think that it is this wonderful flash of color and contrasts and it's really worth studying and there have been so many, let's be honest about it, so many film scores that have used some of these techniques and even quoted some of these passages just right out of the score with a few changes so as not to have too much of a loss of credibility. Enjoy that and I will see you soon for the end of this suite. Thank <laughs> you.